But yeah, just to, to reiterate what uh, DK was saying about DMA, uh, we had such fun experiences with designing the DMA for uh, four or five years, we decided to make our own. Um, and that's how that came about. But the talk I'll be giving now uh, is optimizing your radio settings, settings for algorithms. So like I've uh, talked about in previous uh, new radio discussions, you know, the challenge that a lot of people have is going from devices or chips that uh, the various chip manufacturers make to end products. Uh, and, and there's a lot of gap in between there. And when a variety of companies talk about how to solve that challenge of this gap, you know, MathWorks, when they talk about things, they talk about going from simulation to prototyping to production. Uh, analog devices are usually talk about going from research to evaluation to design to production. Very hardware centric view of the world. And uh, when we go around and talk to radio manufacturers or, or even algorithm design companies, it's more of a research algorithm development uh, design elaboration where they take that algorithm, maybe try to turn it into fixed points, uh, see how that works on their embedded device, and then finally release that into production. And uh, one of the things, like I was talking about earlier this morning, there are different teams, different needs, different hardware, and going from one of these steps to the next can be a challenge for people. So it's really figure out this signal processing piece and then get this signal processing piece embedded. How do all the different groups talk to each other? How do all the different groups uh, ensure that uh, they will have um, the concepts that they need and, and the optimizations they have when they make these steps. So it, it's kind of difficult to talk about this in the abstract. Um, so we'll use actually a, a very rudimentary, but uh, actually fairly popular uh, signal that's out there today called the ADSB. So ADSB is basically a replacement for active radar. So the way radar works is it sends a signal from the antenna. The antenna, the, that signal bounces back from the aircraft, and we can tell where the aircraft is. As those big antennas sweep around, we get about a one every eight seconds update because that's how long it takes it to spin around. So therefore, we can only space airplanes out a certain distances because we only know where they are once every eight seconds. So what uh, everybody decided to do, you know, uh, early 2000s was, hey, we have this great GPS thing. The planes can all get GPS. So what if we just have the planes broadcast to us their GPS location? So once a second, the planes actually broadcast their GPS location. And that's what this ADSB splitter is. So there are exceptions for things. So um, in uh, 2010, the uh, FAA said every airframe has to have an ADSB out on it. Uh, there are exceptions for that. Things that like don't have batteries don't need to have ADSB out on them. And uh, the, one of the reasons we found that out was uh, one of the ADI guys who lives in Colorado, he lives near one of the Air Force training centers, and he saw a tow plane and a glider, and he's like, oh, gotta stop the car, gotta pull up my radio, see what the ADSB, see if there's the ADSB out on the glider and the airplane, and it's only on the, uh, the airplane because the glider doesn't have a battery. Why would you, if something is gliding and you wanna have the best weight to flight ratio, you don't take, take giant batteries and put them inside. So you can actually see in this little green line in the middle, the tow plane uh, circling around in its protected airspace because things that don't have ADSB can't fly within 30 nautical miles of a class, uh, class B airport. But this is a worldwide phenomenon. Uh, so this, uh, a lot of people actually will take their SDRs and a Raspberry Pi, like an RTL SDR, Raspberry Pi, there's lots of software, and uh, they'll actually report to various websites um, where airplanes they see are. So Flight Aware is one, uh, Flight, Ra Flight Radar 24 is another, and Open Sky is another one. Open Sky is an open research actually um, created by three universities in uh, Europe. And uh, so Open Sky, they have all their data, anybody who wants it can have a look. And uh, they, I call this the nerd density chart. There are a lot more airplanes flying around, and you know, if you live in a place that isn't doesn't have dots over it, you can get take your RTL that you uh, some of you got in your bags this morning, uh, plug it into a Raspberry Pi, and you can actually start just transmitting the planes that you receive to uh, those uh, to, to these guys. 
Um, and the antenna that, uh, that a lot of everybody got as part of their badge actually works as an ADSB antenna. Uh, so why are people doing this? Uh, it is improved safety. They can uh, reduce the amount of uh, distance between aircrafts. They uh, more efficiency for users. Uh, the big thing is uh, radar stations cost a lot of money. Uh, ADSB costs a lot less money. And so the FAA believes that between their savings and public's like air savings, because things can fly closer together, have more uh, closer routes. Um, the U.S. alone will save about six billion dollars in the next fifteen years. Yeah. But the impact to end users is that the airplanes are going to be closer together. I'm not sure if that's a super awesome thing or not a good thing. But uh, the rule of thumb today is that uh, planes have to be separated between thirty to eighty miles, and now they're going to uh, fifteen miles. So you're basically going from a collision of every ten minutes, which is that once every eight seconds kind of thing. To once every two minutes. Uh, there's lots of open source ADSB code. Um, actually, you know, started you know 2010 by uh, Blunt uh, to dump 1090 uh, to two different GNU radio pieces to uh, uh, implementation in JavaScript, uh, Python, and even uh, TX. And uh, you know, in 2010. I don't know if he's here, but I didn't see him earlier. But it's actually way, a good way to get your picture into GQ magazine. Uh, ADSB is actually quite easy, so it's just a, a pulse position modulation, meaning that we have either just my pointer going. We have a one by putting the pulse at the beginning of the bit, or a zero by putting the pulse at the end of the bit. And uh, the way that we we always ensure we have a rising or a falling edge on our bit pieces. And so each bit is one microsecond long and that pulse is half a microsecond. We have a preamble of one one not because there's no transition. This is actually something that will never be seen in our message. And that's a great way that we can actually use that to actually detect our preamble versus something in the middle of the message. And then we have basically uh, 56 bits and 112 bits for long and short messages. And what a lot of people do is they basically sample each bit twice, meaning once every half a microsecond, or two mega samples a second. And two mega samples is super easy for an RTL to do. So a lot of this development was done on RTL, Raspberry Pi, x 6 <coughs> So when we want to tune our radio um, for ADSP, now that we're all ADSP experts, we have to decide what kind of receiver quality metrics we need to look at. So that could be the number of good packets received, or the number of bit errors, or CRC errors, or distance to the airplane. And when we talk about the number of good packets received, or bit errors, or CRC errors from an um, analog hardware RF uh, physical layer guy, those are all super terrible metrics because you don't know how many airplanes or you don't know how many messages you've actually missed. If you don't detect the preamble or if you get a CRC error, you throw the message away and you say, okay, well, I got these many messages, and, but how many preambles did you miss? How many airplanes didn't you see? Then he's like, I don't know, but I got some airplanes. It must be good. <laughs> and uh, in, in the RTL community, that's where a lot of these guys are at, because uh, as we'll talk about, um, there's a uh, few people kind of looking at this from a real signal processing kind of standpoint. So one of the other metrics a lot of people use is distance to the airplane. And we'll talk about that, that in a second. So you can actually online say, hey, you know, I am at this specific latitude and longitude. And if an airplane is uh, 10,000 feet in the air, this is where I should be able to see it. And if it's 30,000 or 35,000 feet in the air, this is where I should see it. And that's based on... Your, your location and the hills and the obstructions in the way between you and the various airplanes. But this is also kind of meaningless um, because like not every airplane will fly in those things. Airplanes have flights, they, uh, they shuffle around. But you know, where I live outside of Boston, there's lots of airplanes, I should see lots. Uh, with a message length of 112 microseconds per message, in theory that allows up to almost 9,000 messages per second maximum. 
And uh, aircraft can usually broadcast out more than once a second because they broadcast out different information. So they have like location is a data type. Uh, velocity and vector is a data type. Uh, my toilet is clogged is a data type. So all of these different things are different messages. So airplanes will broadcast out anywhere between five and 10 messages a second from the same aircraft. And when I look at the theoretical piece between what I actually get in my piece before I did any modifications, you can see it's uh, much, much smaller. And if you look at it, you, see, you know, there's various aircraft flying around, and this is the distance, the maximum distance it's seen at that angle. You know, it's still a uh, 125 kilometers away, um, but it varies day to day. And uh, the reason it varies day to day is actually the weather. And it's not because at uh, 1.09 gigahertz changes with temperature, it's because when the winds blow the wrong way, the FAA tells the airplanes to fly in different directions so they can land on the other runway. So you just don't see airplanes because they're flying differently all the time. Um, the other issue that I have is I have lots of trees around my house. So even though my antenna is like up in the roof, um, it's still not as tall as the uh, as the trees are, and my wife doesn't want me to climb the trees as they hang antennas, so. But it is possible to get, so this is a, a person from Europe. They had uh, 1,200 messages a second from 133 different aircraft. And, and this is decoded just on a standard receiver, RTL, SDR, these kind of things. So it's, it's totally possible to do these kind of things. So the quality metrics that I use was actually an eye diagram. So that with a constant and controlled transmitter. So if we look at uh, three bits, we see that there's always a uh, rising or falling edge in the middle. So here's our rising and falling edge in the middle. If we pack, put all these together and overlap them, we should see something that looks kind of something like this. And we want this middle piece to be as open as it can be, because that gives us a good eye. So the first thing when you start building a, receive, a receiver, step number one is always build a transmitter. So that you can A, test your receiver, and you will learn a lot about the signal by actually building a transmitter. And you know, transmitters are actually much easier than receivers. So you know, to build a, uh, a bit stream or build a bunch of samples, we take our preamble, we add 96 random bits, and uh, add the parity so the receivers actually work. Um, and we end up with 240 bits to transmit this code here, and then we just get to see the bit stream, and we can see that you know we're transmitting like zeros and ones. That's what we build up, and that's what a lot of people build up. Um, we don't transmit zeros and ones. The DAC it transmits um, constant things until it gets a change. So it, what the DAC tries to do is transmit this square wave. And, uh, you know, if we look at things spectrally, we see, you know, uh, uh, a DC value, we see uh, it's pretty narrow band, which is great, and if we're minus um, 40, it actually looks not terrible. But these peaks down here, it's like, okay, well, minus 40, that's still kind of uh, pretty high. Um, and if we look at it wider, we see these giant lobes out here which is what we would actually be transmitting if we transmitted this two mega sample kind of thing. And there's two mega sample uh, samples. And we don't want to do that because that's not a great use of the spectrum. And probably violates the, uh, the actual transmitter documents that are 800 bucks each that I'm too cheap to go buy. But when we look out even further, like out to like 20 megahertz, you can kind of see the same thing. So, you know, all these things will alias unless we have some kind of filtering. And when we look at the data that actually comes from real radios, we actually do see the same information. We can see these big um, uh, pieces here because it's just, in order to make those great square waves, it's, uh, it's easier to actually transmit square waves than receive square waves. But spectrally, it's super inefficient. So this is actually data from uh, receivers near the Boston Airport. You could, it's super easy to decode this because on a receiver it looks like a square wave. 
but uh, spectrally, it's probably clobbering over top of other things that are supposed to be there. From, so from a practical transmitter standpoint, we want to try and slow things down to actually consume less bandwidth. So one of the things we'll do to slow things down is instead of transmitting 0 and 1, we'll transmit 0, 1, 0, and minus 1. Because this is all about magnitude, it's about the, the amplitude of the signal, and uh, negative amplitudes are just as big when you take the absolute value as positive amplitudes. And now we've just slowed the signal down by half. So every time we want to make a transition, uh, we just flip things, unless there's two side by side and we keep it the same. And so this waveform is actually much slower than the previous one, and it actually becomes uh, a little bit narrower. But we still have uh, these aliasing effects or these square wave effects, infinite frequency, because we aren't actually transmitting square waves. So the thing that we have to do is we can't really transmit minus one and one in the time domain. So we need to upsample, filter, and bandwidth limit. So if we take our square wave and put it inside our device, depending upon how the device is actually set up, we can use the device to filter, uh, upsample, and bandwidth limit until we actually get a sample that looks like this. And if we take the magnitude, we can see here that it actually matches up with our ADS-B signal. It's not a problem. And when we look at the spectral pieces, it's down minus 120 dB within uh, a few hundred kilohertz. So this is probably what people are doing to kind of get the signals to do things. So we've made our own transmitter. It's all pretty good. So what's actually going on here is we take our square wave, we feed that into, into our radio, and we set this fur filter up here so that it is actually a low pass filter around, uh, I think I had it set up for uh, 700 kilohertz. And then we can actually see some um, change in gain of just the filter. That's to actually make up for the droop of the half bands and the analog filters. So now we have, like I talked this morning, uh, we have a two mega sample coming in here. By the time it hits the DAX, it's at 96. And then we set up a 800 kilohertz filter here, which means that the signal bandwidth coming out is 1.6 meg. So the Wikipedia article that says that uh, ADSP is 50 kilohertz wide is uh, not understanding the math. And we can see that it, it kind of totally works. So we can get our signal and we can feed this into a receiver and it works fine. But then what, what does it really look like? What does our eye diagram look like? So here's our eye diagram. So th this is basically, this area right here is just zoomed in here. And we can see that there's never anything that kind of goes across the top. And there's a few signals that go across the bottom only because of those null characters that we send during, during the uh, preamble. So if we take that uh, previously filtered signal and put it through here, this is actually what we see. So we see, uh, if we are, pretend we're sampling right in the middle, we can see a one or a zero, and then a zero or a one, so that we know if the symbol was a one or a zero. And it could be a one and a one, or a zero and a one, and we can see it kind of changing, but we never see it kind of go across the top and very a few times the bottom. So what we think of, this is our one microsecond symbol, and what we're most interested in is how big this eye is. Because we want this eye to be as large as we can. So, because if we, uh, if these eyes get small and these red areas get bigger, if we accidentally sample in the wrong place, you have no idea if you sample in the middle of this red diamond if it's a one or a zero. So you can't tell. And you just miss that message. Because you'll end up the same place every single bit because there's always bit transitions there. Like, I have no idea what this is, I have no idea what this is, I have no idea what this is. Um, so when you're, and this is Nyquist, it's very difficult to take a two mega sample kind of information and sample it at two mega samples. Your timing has to be exactly right or, or close. And in this case, you're probably like 70% uh, of the time, it'll work. And that's kind of what we see when we go through the analysis. So by uh, changing the filtering on the transmitter, 
You can go from nice big eyes where you don't end up with much problems to uh, lots of problems. And you can actually see how your receiver changes with this, how good it is at decoding things or not decoding things. So what, what I was kind of talking about before, it, it is making a transmitter will tell you a lot about what you need to do in the receiver. And then you have to take your, uh, so we've really been just talking about one signal and feeding it an eye. Um, a lot of people would just like, oh, I'll just throw it through Hilberts. It'll make it imaginary. But uh, square waves and Hilberts at the sample rate don't really work very well together. You need to have oversampled data and these kinds of things. So you really can't do that because you'll get simple smearing. And everything now looks like it's all ran into the same thing. So you really can't use Hilbert. The easiest thing to do is just make I is equal to Q. And when I is equal to Q, you just get uh, 1.7 times on the output. And it works totally fine. Now, so what does this all mean? It's like you're not just changing the input to the DAC. You're also setting up these FERS, these sample rates, the, uh, the RF uh, bandwidth to control your signal both on the input and the output side. And the key thing, if you want to remember anything from this talk, is if you are not explicitly setting them, somebody else is. It's either uh, ADI when we write the device driver, or Edis when they make UHD, or uh, Great Scott when they do the hack RF, or it's the chip guy when he made the chip because uh, there's things that we just leave as the default. And they may be optimizing it for a different uh, signal altogether. So like, for example, the 9361, which is a lot of these radios, the chip was optimized for LTE. So a lot of the settings for the chip, but at the default, even in the device driver, are all LTE settings. And uh, there's not a lot of commonality between ATSB and OFDM. So, you want to try and make sure you do have controls of these kinds of things so you can optimize your system for your application. So in terms of optimizing those device settings, for the ADSP ones, for sure, one of the first things we do is we just turn off the transmitter section. So that actually reduces some noise on the part and makes the receiver a little bit better. So gain settings. So on the receiver, there's manual, automatic, managing this dynamic range, so all these are great, but you can think we're trying to do pulse amplitude or pulse position modulation, and changing the amplitude anywhere in the middle of our message is going to cause a problem. So we basically have five microseconds detecting these four bits here to lock this gain, and then the rest of it has to be like constant, or we're probably going to get a bit error somewhere. So in the device itself, there's a manual mode, there's a slow attack, there's a fast attack. So slow attack is really for slowly changing signals, meaning in the orders of uh, tens or hundreds of microseconds. A lot of this is actually determined by sample rate. So it'll need to see 10 samples at a certain level before it actually changes values, um, which is not what we have in ADS-B. And then there's fast attack, which actually kind of runs through its own state machine. Uh, both of these AGC settings are based on managing average power. So average power in an ads signal is much different than average power in an OFDM signal. So when we talk about average, managing average power, what do we want the average power to be? So we set the average power in an OFDM signal to minus 12 dB. That's what the average power wants to be in the chip. And that gives us room in the chip for the peak to average ratio so that we don't ever exceed full scale and it's kept nice in the linear region. And for QPSK or other modulation schemes, that average power ratio is much different. So for FM radio, for example, so this is a picture of uh, SDR Angel with uh, slow attack set to the default, which is OFDM because it was for LTE. And we can see we're basically giving up two bits of information in our system because we're expecting that average power ratio to be minus 12 dB. And just by changing this target, we actually get much better dynamic range and a much better signal going into the system. So um, 
One of the interesting things about Dump 1090, because it's been around a long time, is uh, Dump 1090 has been forked 879 different times. Uh, and the forks are all over the place, and there's lots of people working on them. The guy who did this one, uh, which is great, took the, uh, the fork that was done for RTL, which is an 8-bit device, and added Pluto to it. Okay, so now we have 12 bits coming in, and all the, the coding in, uh, for the RTL was all 8-bit. So it's like, okay, well, I'll lop off the four LSBs, and it'll all be good. So, you know, on the Pluto device, we have 12 bits. We put that into a 16-bit container, and then he goes and lops off the four. So this is what he actually gets. But he didn't change the AGC settings at all. So he has, there's two bits that are sitting at the top, expected minus 12 dB average power coming in. So he's basically made, turned Pluto into a six bit device. So when, he, when people say, it's like, oh, you know, my Pluto doesn't work as good as my RTL, it's like, dude, your software's all messed up. And it's not that the person who did this is dumb or doesn't understand, all this stuff is hard and it's like super specific to the hardware. You, you kind of have to be an expert on all things to try and do these kinds of things. And it, it's difficult. So, you know, he took his pieces and the pieces that were working for RTL and put Pluto in there. He had it working, he had it decoding airplanes. It totally works. But how many airplanes does he, do you miss? And then the answer is lots. So the other one is uh, another person uh, took uh, this and, you know, he puts it in slow attack mode which just means maximum gain, because the system will never be able to respond fast enough. So, in the game tables of the device, there's all these settable settings from LNA to gain in the LNA, to gain in the mixer, to gain in the TIA, to gain in the analog filters, to digital gain. And uh, we basically fill out this table, and depending upon what's happening in the system with your average power level, you either just move up or down in this table. And uh, then you have these detectors, and you detect the LMT, which is just LMA mixer TIA, and then ADC peak, uh, low power, and digital saturation. So we measure things in the analog domain in like microseconds, and, uh, milliseconds, things in the ADC domain, in the digital domain, based on sample rates, and all of these kinds of things, trying to figure out what's going on and how to set these things up. And as you can imagine, there are too many settings to try and optimize by hand. So, you know, when somebody says, hey, uh, I have this signal, I'm trying to optimize the AGC, you know, we just like, hey man, good luck. And uh, th that was not a super compelling, comforting answer for most people. Uh, so what we did is we worked on a, uh, a system level simulation, and uh, we can generate waveforms, we have the receiver model, we have all the HEC control logic, we can actually put in an ADSB receiver, so that we can actually, from like a Monte Carlo or search kind of approach, throw in as many different combinations and permutations as we want, change every single setting, and figure out basically which setting works best. And so, you know, the answer now is like, hey, run this simulation, it takes two days, but at the end, you'll actually get an answer. And everyone's like, oh yeah, no problem. Two days of me pushing go and then coming back in a Monday sounds great. So it, that's basically what it does. You have your waveforms, you put it through some uh, MATLAB pieces, and uh, you, you can actually get answers out to help tune your AGC. And there's some visualization pieces to help monitor, like, okay, when I, when I change this, what does this actually do to my eye diagram? What does it do to my CRC errors? What does it do to these kinds of things? Which is kind of a big data visualization piece. And uh, we have this discussion internally of, is it really Monte Carlo or is it just a giant for loop? <laughs> and it's like, oh, well, some guy's opinion is Monte Carlo is a giant for loop. Well, uh, maybe. But uh, that, and then you can take your results from your simulation and put them right into the, uh, the device and uh, get some actually settings, uh, these kinds of things. So your receiver HEC can actually be optimized by that. And then you have the fur filters, the analog filters, these kinds of things, which doesn't need to be the same as the TX, it's totally independent. And usually on a receiver, you actually want to keep that as wide open as makes sense because 
If somebody is sending to a square wave, it's easier to decode. And so you don't want to make that as narrow as you can, unless you're in a very noisy channel or have an adjacent channel blocker or, or something like that. Uh, the other thing that we did, or are in the process of doing, is uh, actually, instead of coming out at two mega samples a second, come out at 12. And have the FPGA actually determine, based on correlators, which is the best phase to look at. And then we can either downsample by five or downsample by six to get two or 2.4 mega samples a second. And then that actually goes into the arm. So we've actually done this for um, 802.11 as well, where we actually look for the beacon frame receiver at 20 mega samples a second on the FPGA on Pluto. And then when we see it, then we send samples. That way you don't, uh, the burden of USB 2 doesn't limit your uh, overhead because you know you're actually sending good data across the uh, USB link. And then it becomes optimizing the algorithm. So, you know, uh, when we look at this, because we've upsampled this by 48, um, it's 48 different phases to actually look at. So I can extract the data from here, make data files, 48 different data files from the same thing, and then pass that into my receiver and have it emulate two mega samples a second. Or uh, 40 different phases in 2.4. And the reason I talk about 2.4 mega samples a second was uh, one other fork of uh, the Dump 1090, they actually moved the sample rate to 2.4, so they get six samples for five symbols, and they use a correlation technique to actually just extract things. And that's why they're actually able to receive more airplanes than the other forks that still sample at two, because they're not, if something lines up wrong, it doesn't line up wrong for every single bit. Uh, testing Dump 1090 is super easy. Um, it does just take files, uh, either sign 16 or sign 8. There is GR ADSB, but um, at the lowest end, it uh, is still this two mega samples per second kind of thing, so it will uh, fail from the same way. And uh, then there's optimizing the receive path. So uh, this is this is my favorite. This is actually an FAA certified ADSB antenna. I think it's uh, $600. But it's certified for 350 miles an hour at 50,000 feet. Uh, this do-it-yourself one from uh, Flight 24 is, is not certified. <laughs> and then, but there are ones on uh, Amazon that are uh, super reasonable. Uh, the other piece is the uh, FlightAware like filters. So uh, FlightAware, they actually make a filter specifically for ADS-B that uh, I use right here. And, uh, you know, it has... What shows up on the Amazon page when you buy it is just this picture here. And what you're really interested in is this picture here, which goes out much further. So I think this goes out to um, uh, 20 gig, something like that. Maybe it was like Tim. Uh, it was Tim. Uh, but you want to be able to see what it is that third harmonic of the LO, because that's actually the most thing you're concerned about. And then there's another one. Uh, this is an LNA plus filter, and uh, this is great, but uh, the only specifications on the Amazon webpage for this is the picture. So you can look at it and it's like, oh, it's actually pretty good. So in band, it looks pretty awesome, but then out of band, um, there's actually a positive gain on the third harmonic of the LO, which then if there's any signal there, is going to uh, alias back, and you'll actually see that in your <coughs> causing noise and grief and problems. So what I end up doing is I actually just use them both together. And uh, it's the power of AND. That's what my boss tells me all the time. So we have our you know, 13 megahertz kind of uh, weight or, uh, uh, filter. And then at that third harmonic, you're down uh, 20 or 30 dB, which is great. And then there's that production piece. So we figured out our signal processing, done that uh, embedded design elaboration piece got our algorithms running, testing it, uh, making sure it'll work. And then uh, what we, I did is I just cross-compiled Dump 1090 for ARM, and I run it directly on the Pluto. And I feed that to OpenSky directly on the Pluto. So I just plug in a uh, Ethernet uh, USB dongle and uh, hook up to my home network, and it just uh, runs and shoots data to OpenSky. And then just created a small CGI shell script to turn it on and off. So if things are... So this is actually running from the device itself. 
Uh, there's a little web server that actually runs here and it goes to open maps. And uh, this is uh, this routing data from this antenna. It... Oh, yeah, okay, sorry. Thank you. Okay. So, it, yeah, if anybody wants to come see the demo, I guess the, uh, we'll have it set up at the booth. But the things that are left to do is send patches upstream, make the firmware public and then just uh, add more modern communications DSP to decode the algorithms at higher rates. And uh, one of the things I did actually find down here is that is actually a tray table in an airplane. Uh, it's not, uh, taking radios on airplanes are not against uh, any issue that I'm aware of. The uh, TSA actually has something on their website that says radios are okay to take on airplanes, um, as long as you don't transmit at the wrong times. <laughs> Uh, especially transmit ADSB. <laughs> no, it is, so uh, even though I worked on a transmitter, you don't transmit. So the things you would need to transmit ADSB would be just like a, a Pluto, a little Python, and a desire to go to jail for a long time. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the TSA says it's fine to take radios on airplanes. I'm not sure if they have this in mind, but uh, I do it all the time. <laughs> But so it's, it's all about, you know, real world communications are all about the weakest link. And that weakest link can be hardware, it can be algorithm, and it's, uh, you can't optimize the algorithm if, you, if your hardware setup isn't actually configured for the signals that you're interested in. And with that, uh, I'm going to stop in two minutes. All right, thank you. Okay, thanks.